The GLC brings a bit of Mercedes polish to the premium part of the upper mid-sized SUV segment, and this second generation model is a significant step forward from the original. The whole of the mainstream engine range has been electrified, and infotainment has taken an equally large step forward. Plus, efficiency, refinement and build quality represent strong points. It's a very complete package. The Mercedes GLC has quickly become one of the company's most important models. The badge for this upper mid-size SUV model line didn't even exist until 2015, but the original version racked up over 2.6 million sales, making it the brand's global bestseller and ramping up expectation for this model, its second generation successor. Mercedes has actually been in this section of the market since 2008, when it launched what was then called the GLK, a car the engineers unaccountably failed to engineer for right-hand drive markets. Mistakes don't get much bigger than that, but the R&D team have done their best to make up for it since. The old X253 Mark I GLC model offered in SUV and SUV coupe body styles was the first car to introduce the option of air suspension to the mid-sized SUV segment, a feature previously only available on much larger crossovers. Plus, it was pioneering in its introduction of plug-in hybrid technology and as part of a significant facelift in 2019 also gained what then was groundbreaking 48 volt mild hybrid tech too. So a lot was expected of this replacement X254 series model, which arrived here in late 2022. Again, with that two-way choice of body styles. This conventional SUV body shape, which arrived first, and the swoopier SUV coupe version, which followed in 2023. As before, the GLC shares plenty with its C-Class stablemate, which means sleeker looks and a cabin with a cutting edge package of screen tech. Even bigger changes lie beneath the bonnet. All the engines on offer are now electrified of either the mild or plug-in hybrid sort, the latter variant setting new efficiency standards for PHEVs in this segment. Technology will be trying in this test car. More surprising at the pricier end of the range is that six and eight cylinder GLC models are no more with a four cylinder capacity adopted across the board, even for the fieriest Mercedes AMG performance variants. It all sounds very promising from a car that faces strong competition from models like Audi's Q5, BMW's X3, Volvo's XC60, Jaguar's F-Pace and the Lexus NX in the crucial upper mid-size premium SUV segment. But big price rises accompany the evolutionary updates, pushing an upper spec GLC model like this one up towards the kind of price you might need for a full EV model of this sort. Is this second generation GLC really worth as much as Mercedes thinks it is? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. What are your expectations in terms of driving a premium, upper-sized, mid-level luxury SUV? A reasonably commanding and luxurious seating position? Plenty of pulling power? Impressive refinement? Well, as before, the GLC delivers all of these things. But this time, it does so with a completely electrified engine range. We'll get to that, but before we do, it's necessary to point out that what all these mechanicals ride upon is substantially different this time around. It's still C-Class based, of course, but because those C-Class underpinnings are now borrowed from the fifth generation W206 design, they're now very different, featuring a heavily revised version of Mercedes MRA modular platform with lots of borrowed S-Class tech. Despite all of this, in the first few miles of your test drive, you might also think that much is very familiar from the usual mid-sized Mercedes formula. Sufficient power, a smooth shifting nine-speed automatic gearbox, and secure, predictable control responses. 
bolted to that very different chassis is a redesigned multi-link suspension setup comprising a four-link axle at the front and a multi-link axle at the rear mounted to a subframe, a setup which we'd hoped would have significantly improved ride quality. Perhaps it might have done if the brand had chosen softer settings for our market, but as it is, a little disappointingly for a Mercedes, ride quality still isn't one of this car's strongest traits. In other countries, you can improve that by specifying airmatic air suspension, an option available on top versions of the previous generation version of this model, but not, from launch anyway, being offered in the UK on mainstream versions of this one. That feature would have given this car a unique selling point in its class, as would another piece of optional dynamic drive tech available on Continental GLCs, but not on British bound ones, four wheel steering. At least we get all the main available engines, which in the mainstream parts of the range now have 48 volt EQ boost mild hybrid tech in their diesel forms as well as their petrol ones. With every single variant in this second generation lineup, you'll find a two litre four cylinder engine beneath the bonnet, mated to a 9G Tronic nine speed automatic gearbox and four Matic all wheel drive. Despite prevailing market trends, for the time being at least, most GLCs will continue to be sold in diesel form, probably in base 194 horsepower 220D guys, or possibly in uprated 266 horsepower 300D form, the latter improving the rest to 62 mile an hour time from 8 to 6.3 seconds, and the top speed from 136 to 151 miles an hour. The single conventional GLC 300 petrol derivative has 254 horsepower and manages 6.2 seconds and 149 miles an hour. If that's not fast enough, then you'll want to know that the same 48 volt 2 litre mild hybrid petrol engine makes a further appearance tuned up to 402 horsepower in the Mercedes AMG GLC 43 4Matic Plus model. As with other models from the brand, all these conventional GLCs feature the usual dynamic select driving mode system, which, as before, has four settings, comfort, eco, sport and individual, the latter allowing the driver to tailor the settings individually. The other versions in the range are all plug-in hybrids in various rather different and very sophisticated flavours. The two mainstream PHEV variants take the 2-litre petrol and diesel engines we've just referenced and make them to a 134 horsepower electric motor, creating what look on paper to be quite prodigious levels of combined output. 308 horsepower for the 300E petrol model we're trying here and 335 horsepower for its unique in-class 300DE diesel stablemate. In each case, the electric motor is now powered by a much bigger 31.2 kilowatt hour battery, bigger than the one in the C300E and nearly three times the size of the one in the previous generation plug-in GLC, which agreeably means you get nearly three times the EV driving range, up to 80 miles, though actually more like 60 miles in real life. Enough to keep commuting folk pretty clear of fuel stations anyway. All of this technology means quite a lot of weight, of course. This GLC 300E tips the scales at 2,355 kilos, nearly half a tonne heavier than the equivalent GLC 300 petrol model. You feel that in the rather lethargic cornering demeanour and the even firmer edge to the ride over poor surfaces, despite Mercedes' decision to fit self-levelling rear air suspension to plug-in hybrid GLCs. On paper, the impact on performance of all this bulk doesn't seem to be as great. This 300E variant makes 62 miles an hour from rest in 6.7 seconds. It's 6.4 for the diesel plug-in version. And both variants top out at 135 miles an hour. In reality, on the road though, anything approaching really rapid progress has to be accompanied by rather breathless revving. Or at least it does once the engine's cut in to relieve the EV part of the powertrain which happens pretty seamlessly. 
you have a different set of dynamic select drive modes to work with in a plug-in hybrid GLC. Sport is the only familiar one, which you have to have engaged if you want the provided steering wheel paddles to shift gears as you might expect them to. In the other two main drive modes, hybrid or full electric EL, those paddles alter brake regeneration settings from strong D- to weak D or D+, but it makes more sense to simply tug on the right-hand paddle for a few seconds and engage the Eco Assist D Auto setting that does all the regeneration setting stuff for you. Back on the Dynamic Select Drive setting home screen, there's also a B mode that can preserve battery charge for later in your trip when you might be better able to use it. We're not going to spend too long briefing you on the final GLC model, the Mercedes-AMG GLC 63S 4Matic Plus, which deserves its own separate test. If you're familiar with this flagship variant as a 4-litre V8, you'll be shocked to find it reinvented here as a 2-litre, 4-cylinder plug-in hybrid, and perhaps even more shocked to find that even so there's even more power than before. There's 469 horsepower from the engine alone, which makes it the world's most powerful 4-cylinder unit. Add in the rear axle-mounted 204 horsepower electric motor, which has its own two-speed gearbox, and total system output rises to a class-leading 680 horsepower. That figure backed by a thumping 1,020 newton meters of torque and eight main drive settings. No doubt the talented AMG engineers at Alfaltabac have done wonders in creating a GLC chassis and damping setup, able to handle all that power. But they're not miracle workers, and the basic truth is that the fundamentals here aren't in any way designed for driving entertainment. That might sound an obvious thing to say about a heavy, upper, mid-sized SUV, but the reality is that quite a few class rivals do a better job when it comes to stringing a few corners together. Porsche's Macan and Alfa Romeo's Stelvio spring to mind. And while a Jaguar F-Pace or an Audi Q5 would be a better choice if you prioritised a more forgiving ride. But GLC customers don't seem to care, and to some extent we can understand why. There's a desirable level of polish to everything this car does, and, aided by new sandwich-style glass, it's exceptionally refined. Plus, there's an unbettered level of autonomous drive tech in this segment, if that's what you're into. If you want a plug-in hybrid in this class, a completely fresh segment standard's been set here. You can even take this Mercedes on rougher tracks. There's a dedicated off-road drive mode for that, complete with compass, altitude, front drive camera, and GPS positioning screen data, plus a DSR, or downhill speed regulator. All of which will almost certainly be never used by the majority of customers. But it's all part of the statement this GLC wants to make on their behalf, an upwardly mobile one that's evolved nicely with this second generation model. You'd certainly recognise this as a GLC if you happen to be familiar with this model line. Looking at this Mark II X254 version though is a bit like encountering a friend who's been at a health farm for a couple of months and has emerged leaner and fitter. Rounded edges and clean surfacing bring some of the look of the current fifth generation C-Class to this crossover, but the fact that this GLC is also available in a separate coupe body style relieves this standard SUV variant of the need to look too self-consciously sporty. There's still just enough visual dynamism here though to interest someone who might also be considering say a Jaguar F-Pace or an Alfa Stelvio in this segment. Sensual purity was apparently the design theme here, and whatever that really means, it's clearly about evolution rather than revolution. Marginal gains and little detail touches making quite a difference. Take the now more slippery 0.29 CD drag coefficient, a figure which not very long ago would have been truly exceptional for any kind of SUV. Now it's merely just very good. 
The 4,718 millimeter body length is 60 millimeters lengthier than before. And wheel sizes for mainstream models are set at either 19 or more likely, as in this case, 20 inches in size. These side steps and the silver roof bars are standard across the range, disguising the fact that the car now sits four millimeters lower. A more defining perspective for this second generation design can be found here at the front, which features headlamps that connect directly to the radiator grille to emphasize a vehicle width that actually hasn't changed. In fact, with the mirrors extended, it's actually 21 millimeters narrower than before. An AMG line style trim package of some kind is now a non-negotiable part of GLC ownership, which means that this bespoke bumper with its open twin finned corner outlets and impractically shiny silvered lower skid plate. This diamond radiator grille is part of that package too and gets flanked by LED high performance headlights that, providing you avoid entry level trim, will come fitted with the brand's intelligent blue tinged digital light system. Do extra little details like the tiny italicized Mercedes script at the bottom of the windscreen really matter? Of course they do. The rear treatment is an equally significant part of this X254 model's sleeker look, featuring a subtle roof spoiler and slimmer two-section, three-dimensional style LED rear lights that aim to emphasize the wider track. Again, the AMG line trim packages give you a restyled bumper, which comes with this simulated chrome underguard, encasing the chrome look tailpipes. Just as important, of course, is what you can't see, the Mercedes MRA2 rear wheel drive modular platform, a modified version of the structure also used by the current S-Class. Strong and stiff, it makes extensive use of aluminium, which helps to counter some of the extra weight from the electrified powertrains. All of this though is merely the prelude to the thing that Mercedes thinks will really sell you this car, the cabin. Let's take a look. Sure enough, if you're wavering about the extra spend a GLC will inevitably require, this cabin might well persuade you. Apart from the higher seating position, it's pretty difficult to differentiate from a C-Class, but that's a very good thing, as the fifth generation version of that model has set new standards in interior design. The vast screen tech certainly striking the center display, appearing to float above a wing-shaped dash design that's topped in the center by three central vents with flattened round nozzles, apparently supposed to be reminiscent of the engine nacelles of an aircraft. As with the silver floating door card switch consoles, it'd be nice if these vents felt as good to the touch as they look to the eye. And not everyone will like the vastly over-buttoned steering wheel festooned with fiddly touch-sensitive controls on its twin horizontal bars. For us, there's also a suspicion of corrugated cardboard with this top AMG line Premium Plus models anthracite line structure lime fascia trim too, though lots of folk will probably love it. Overall, though, you can't deny that what's on offer here is properly sophisticated. The uber subtle ambient lighting strips, the supple perforated wheel rim leather, the stitched upper dash top, and on this top variant, the intricate Burmester speaker grills. It's all exquisite. The older generation GLC had a cabin that was functional and of high quality, but about as stylish as Angela Merkel. This is very different, and yet, despite the switch to Mercedes flagship manufacturing plants at Sindelfingen, we're not sure that the quality is quite as bulletproof as in an Audi Q5 or even a BMW X3. But you might not care about that because the ergonomics are brilliant and it all looks so good. Especially this big 11.9 inch central multimedia color display around which the cabin architecture is based. It's in Tesla style portrait format and is angled steeply at about 45 degrees, which can sometimes attract unwelcome reflections, but the graphics are crisp and sophisticated looking and the screen size means that plenty of detail can be displayed. For example, when viewing maps. It's also nicely laid out and small buttons for commonly accessed features like driving modes, the parking camera, car info and audio volume are arranged across the monitor's bottom edge. Press the screen's home icon and this series of icons for the key functions appear, which are easy to quickly scroll through to access apps, settings, 
comfort, phone, radio, media, and so on. This central display isn't actually quite as big as it looks because quite a chunk of the bottom half of it is taken up by permanently displaying controls for the climate system. We preferred the previous old-fashioned centre console switches, and you might too. Even though these replacement virtual buttons are always in the same position, it takes more focus than pressing a physical button or turning a real dial. There's also no real haptic feedback, so it's difficult to tell if you've pressed a particular function or not. All of which is a further incentive to master the intuitive Hey Mercedes voice command functionality, via which you can control almost anything, though like all such systems, it's not very difficult to catch it out. Once you've set things to your liking and saved your profile, holding your finger to this fingerprint sensor at the base of the monitor will log you on and change the car to your settings. For example, pairing your phone, altering the seats and mirrors to your positions, and remembering favourite radio stations, most recent destinations, behaviour-based predictions, business calendar entries, and emails. This whole setup runs the second generation version of the brand's MBUX infotainment system, which means that media connectivity has taken a big step forward. So there are over the air updates and live streaming services so that owners can link accounts to services like Spotify and access them in the car. You can even link up to and control domestic equipment thanks to the smart home function. So before you reach home, you could potentially open the gates, activate the room lights and turn up the heating. Conceivably, you could even put the oven on, assuming, of course, that your dinner's already inside it. With all of this sophistication, it'd be a bit disappointing to find yourself viewing conventional analogue gauges through the three-spoke wheel. And, of course, those have been consigned to history. Instead, all models get this 12.3-inch digital instrument panel, a 2D display rather than the 3D version found in the S-Class, but one that's bright and vibrant with rich graphics. There's many display possibilities with twin virtual dials in the classic and understated layouts and a single more complicated and rather ostentatious gauge if you select red-themed sport. You can also have full screen navigation or a driving assistance display, both with a digital speedo. And there are separate instrument screen layouts for servicing and off-road driving too. The ambient lighting also changes according to the theme selected or can be adjusted to an almost infinite degree using the centre screen. Here we've got a head-up display too, though you only get that with pricey top-spec premium plus trim. In its augmented reality setting, this can project so much info onto the windshield in front of you that it can become distracting. So it's fortunate that there are also less cluttered standard and minimal head-up options, plus coloured sport and eco display ones. There's even an off-road head-up display format. As referenced earlier, one thing you're going to find fiddly at first, but which you'll have to get used to, are these tiny touch-sensitive steering wheel buttons arranged across two bars on either side, running horizontally and parallel to one another. There's sound logic behind this, as it allows related controls to be grouped together. You operate the two screens with upper left and upper right buttons, deal with the adaptive cruise control on the lower right spoke, and with volume, phone and voice commands on the lower left. The standard sports seats are upholstered in either man-made Artico hide or, as in this case, in real leather. They're properly supportive, feature standard heating and lumbar support, are of course electrically operated further up the range and don't have to be had in dour black. Sadly though, for our market, they can't be had with S-Class-like, super luxurious looking quilted upholstery. Getting comfortable is very easy thanks to a wide range of adjustment that also extends to the steering wheel, which has a power-operated column on plusher variants. And as we said, the trimming's lovely but closer inspection reveals that there are also plenty of hard, brittle plastics to be found further down. Not everyone likes this spindly gear selector stalk either. 
At junctions, these large A-pillars, particularly at the base, can block the view at certain angles, but the over-the-shoulder view is fine by class standards, and manoeuvring is aided by a rear-view camera and all-round parking sensors. Mercedes also gets most of the practical stuff right. These concave door cards allow for front door bins that are deep and long, stretching out of sight almost back towards the B-pillar. They'll easily accommodate a large 1.5-litre bottle. And there's also a good-sized twin-lidded storage box between the seats with a couple of USB ports, though they're of the USB-C variety, so you'll probably need these slightly unsightly converter leads. Ahead of that, there's a smartly lidded area concealing a couple of cup holders, another USB-C port, and the standard wireless charging mat. There's a big glove box, and you get the usual ticket clips in the sun visors too. Not everything's great, though and overhead sunglasses compartments being forgotten and there's no extra storage space behind the portrait screen of the sort you get from some other brands using this style of design. Right, let's take a look in the back. Now, one day soon, the new generation of upper mid-sized SUVs with bespoke EV platforms will offer a lot more rear seat space than is possible from a combustion engine model like this one. You can already see that with the not much larger fully electric EQE SUV model you'll find on the other side of your Mercedes dealership showroom. But by the modest current standards of its class, this GLC, aided by a 2.9 meter wheelbase, looks on paper to have a rear cabin just about sufficient in size for the needs of a small family. Sure enough, despite a sloping roof line, even on this standard SUV body shape, there's more than enough space in the back for a pair of six-footers. Both headroom and leg space are adequate for the class as long as you're sitting two in the rear. There's room for a middle-seated adult on this central bench, but the seat sculpting discourages it, as does the hugely prominent centre transmission tunnel. With this GLC, Mercedes continues to miss a trick against its obvious rivals by providing a rear bench that can't be specified to slide back and forth. The backrest doesn't recline either. At least headroom is reasonable, though you'll lose a few millimetres of it on a plusher variance fitted like this one with a panoramic glass roof. Even if you don't get your GLC with that, the ambience back here isn't too dour thanks to these relatively large rear quarter light windows. The high-end trimming theme continues with little touches like these silver door card switch panels and a central armrest with a leading edge button which you press once to get a pen cubby and twice for twin cup holders. There are aeroplane style flappy seat back pockets along with large door bins big enough to take a 1.5 litre bottle you get grab handles with coat hooks and reading lights, plus twin central vents that will be accompanied by this climate control panel if you stretch to a really pricey model with four-zone climate control. If you have to fix child seats, you'll be pleased to find ISOFIX attachments with neat retractable covers. Moving to the back, access to the boot is via the expected powered tailgate, which opens to reveal a wide square cargo area that can be embellished with this thick floor mat and varies quite a bit in size depending on engine choice. It's 600 litres in size for the base petrol and diesel models, 50 litres more than a conventional BMW X3, and for some reason you get a little more, 620 litres, if you opt for the faster of the two conventional diesels, the GLC 300D. There's a 55 litre reduction in those figures if you opt for the alternative GLC Coupe body shape. With either body style, if your preference is for a plug-in hybrid drivetrain, then predictably you'll have to lower your storage expectations by quite a lot. Think just 400 litres with this PHEV SUV test car. It's 390 litres for a GLC Coupe in PHEV form. The plug-in hybrids lose underfloor space too. You get only this small leading edge lower compartment that theoretically would just about fit a charging lead, but in practice probably won't because it also has to be cluttered up with the kind of things we have here. Jack, tyre sealant kit, warning triangle and so on. 
On the plus side with the PHEV models, you get rear air suspension, which allows you to lower the back of the car to help with loading bulky items into the boot. At least the main cargo area is practically shaped and properly fitted out with a netted compartment to the left and an elasticated strap on the right. There are bag hooks on both sides and the usual four tie down points. And Mercedes has provided a flexible 40 20 40 rear backrest split, so long items like skis can be slid in between a couple of rear seated folk if need be. When you do need to flatten everything, there are cargo sidewall switches to do it, and the backrest folds nearly flat, revealing up to 1,640 litres of space with the conventionally engined SUV models. It's 1,490 with a conventionally engined GLC coupe. With a GLC SUV in PHEV form like this, the seats down cargo area figure would be 1,497 litres or 1,335 with a GLC Coupe PHEV. Finally, here's a really nice little touch. When you retract the rear backrests, the front seats automatically move forward out of the way of it, then automatically return backwards when you erect the backrest again. The car's full of neat little features like that. We're used to new car prices spiralling in this post-Covid age, but not by quite as much as this. Think in terms of a £10,000 hike over the previous generation GLC model, which at the time of this Mark II design's launch in late 2022 and this test in spring 2023 meant a starting price for the least expensive variant up at £52,000 and a mainstream span up to around £75,000. If you're comparing against a C-Class estate, think in terms of an equivalent GLC costing you around £4,000 more. Though across the range, that extra spend does get you the 4MATIC four-wheel drive system that, at the time of filming, you couldn't have on a mainstream C-Class model. As on all Mercedes these days, you have to have auto transmission, of course. In this case, the usual 9G Tronic 9-speed setup. If you like the idea of a plug-in hybrid GLC like this test car, rather than a base conventional GLC diesel, then you're going to need to add about £10,000 more to your budget, most of which a company car driver would get back in the first few years of ownership in reduced benefit in kind taxation payments. There are two body styles in the range, this SUV version and the sleeker GLC Coupe. The latter, having been just announced at the time of this test, we expect it to require around £3,000 more. Either way, there are three trim levels, AMG Line, AMG Line Premium, and as in this case, AMG Line Premium Plus, which have a nice simple pricing structure. There's a cost of £5,000 each time you step up the rungs. When you compare engines like for like, you're going to need a lot more, of course, for the full fat Mercedes AMG performance variants. The GLC 43 version with its tuned mild hybrid engine remains just about affordable, but you'll be getting up towards six figures if you want the top 6.3 S model. You'll want some pricing perspective against segment rivals. Well, the short answer is that a GLC will cost you more, but not that much more. Three of the alternatives you might be looking at, BMW's X3, Audi's Q5 and Volvo's XC60, all start at around £5,000 to £6,000 less, as does the Alfa Romeo Stelvio. And a base version of the full hybrid Lexus NX would save you up to £8,000. But a Jaguar F-Pace gets within £3,000 for this Mercedes and a base Porsche Macan would actually cost around £1,500 more. Remember that if your preference is for the GLC Coupe body shape, then the direct alternatives from BMW and Audi change to be the BMW X4 and the Audi Q5 Sportback, though the price differential we mentioned earlier doesn't alter much. Whatever your preference for GLC body shape, there's more of a price gap against rivals if you're comparing competing plug-in hybrids against the PHEV versions of this Mercedes. But bear in mind that with the GLC in this form, you're getting vastly more EV driving range for your money than you will do from direct competitors. 
If you've considered all the alternatives and the GLC pricing structure hasn't put you off, then you're going to want to know whether the standard equipment levels are generous. So let's take a look at that now. All models get the brand's AMG line styling pack, which includes a sporty front and rear bumper, aluminium look running boards and a diamond radiator grille. And the brand has standardized LED high performance headlights, privacy glass and power folding mirrors. Dynamic select driving mode selection is included across the range as well, with which the conventional engines allows drivers to pick between eco, comfort and sport, as well as individual and off-road options. And there's a parking package with sensors and a reversing camera. Inside, standard cabin kit includes a 12.3-inch instrument cluster screen, along with heated, powered front sports seats featuring four-way lumbar support and trimmed in Artico man-made leather upholstery. Plus, there's a multifunction leather sports steering wheel and a 64-colour ambient lighting system with 10-colour moods and three dimming zones. Two-zone thermatic climate control and wireless smartphone charging are also standard, as are cruise control, auto headlamps and wipers, an Urban Guard Thatcham Category 1 alarm, and plenty of camera safety tech, which we'll brief you on in a moment. Infotainment is taken care of by a high-resolution 11.9-inch central media display with hard disk navigation, a fingerprint scanner, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration, and the usual Hey Mercedes virtual assistant voice control system. And of course, there's an app, as there always is. This one's called Mercedes Me Connect and does all the usual vehicle monitoring things, like reminding you when a service is due. Plus, it can automatically detect and share with you details on your car's wear and tear items. In addition, the app gives you a one-touch button for fast accident and breakdown recovery and automatically alerts the rescue services in the event of an accident. It can even track your GLC if it's stolen, tell you if it's left pre-agreed geographical boundaries if you lend it out, and tell you where the vehicle is if you forget where you've parked it. Earlier, we mentioned the Urban Guard Alarm. That works via this app, monitoring the car when it's parked and alerting you remotely should it be bumped, should the alarm go off, or worse, should someone be trying to tow it away. Your phone will instantly tell you how severe the parking damage is and on which part of the vehicle it occurred. So that's covered base AMG line spec. Next up is mid-level AMG line premium trim, which swaps out the base model's 19-inch five twin-spoke AMG alloy wheels for a set of larger 20-inch AMG five-spoke rims and adds a digital light system to the LED headlights. AMG line premium spec also gets you heat and noise insulating glass, keyless entry, a memory package for the front seat and steering column, and a 360-degree panoramic view camera. Plus, augmented reality is added to the navigation system, which uses forward cameras to show the view ahead with navigation instructions overlaid on the screen. If you can stretch to this test car's top AMG Line Premium Plus trim, you'll get the rear climate system that comes with Thermotronic four-zone automatic climate control, plus a head-up display and an excellent Burmester 3D surround sound system with 13 speakers dotted about a cabin upholstered in black leather and trimmed in anthracite line structure lime wood. At this level in the range, the 20-inch wheel design changes to a multi-spoke style. There's a twin-pane panoramic glass roof, and the digital light system gets a projection function. As you'd expect, the Mercedes-AMG models have their own bespoke equipment packages, including extra drive modes, an AMG speed shift version of the auto gearbox, AMG ride control air suspension with continuously adjustable damping, and AMG alloys ranging between 19 and 21 inches, depending on specification. What about options across the mainstream GLC range? Well, there aren't many. Unless you want your GLC finished in solid polar white, you'll need to pay for metallic paint. We've got spectral blue here. Or one of the pricier and fancier manufacturer metallic shades. 
with the Artico leather upholstery of the AMG line and AMG line premium variants, you can change the colour from black to never grey or sienna brown at no cost. If with this top AMG line premium plus model, you don't like the standard black leather upholstery, there's the no cost option of changing the colour to sienna brown or bright power red. What else? Well, if you tow, there's an electrically deployable tow bar. This includes ESP trailer stabilization, which uses the stability control system to control trailer oscillations or snaking, if necessary, also reducing engine torque and breaking the wheels. As for practical accessories, well, there's boot stowage crate, Isofix child seats, a cool box, floor mats, and a reversible mat for the load space. Enough with that, let's switch to safety, which down the years has always been a primary consideration for Mercedes with this car. All the key features you'd expect are present and correct. There's active brake assist with turning maneuver function, an autonomous braking system that also automatically applies the brakes if you inadvertently turn in front of another vehicle. Active lane keeping assist is also standard there to apply gentle steering wheel pressure to help ensure the car doesn't wander out of its line. Plus, there's a tension assist, which provides alerts to prevent long journey fatigue. Avoid base AMG line trim, and you also get blind spot assist, which lets the driver know if a vehicle is in the blind spot. Should a collision occur, there's a full suite of airbags for all GLCs, and we do mean a full suite, besides the usual front front side and full length curtain bags. There are side bags in the front seats, pelvis and window bags for all occupants, a knee airbag for the driver, and rather more unusually, a front center airbag between the driver and front passenger seats. There's also an active bonnet, which rises in the event of an impact with a pedestrian to reduce the risk of injury. In the rear, as you'd expect, are two Isofix child seat attachment points with top tether attachments. If you want more in terms of camera safety kit, you'll only be offered the chance to specify it if you've stretched all the way up to the top of the range and got yourself this AMG Line Premium Plus model. Should that be the case, you'll be offered the opportunity to find £1,700 more for the Driving Assistance Package Plus pack. We've got that package fitted here and it includes a range of key extra camera safety elements, amongst which are features that also give this car limited autonomous driving capability. Let's talk you through it all. The Driving Assistance Package Plus pack menu starts with Active Blind Spot Assist, which actively steers you back to safety if you're about to pull out in front of another vehicle. There's braking stuff too, of course. Active Braking Assist with Cross Traffic Function, which can help to avoid collisions with vehicles ahead, crossing traffic and also pedestrians, mitigating the potential consequences. There's also an Evasive Steering Assist, that can support you in making evasive maneuvers if a pedestrian or cyclist suddenly appears in your path. There's also pre-safe impulse side, which better prepares the cabin for a heavy side impact. Using inflatable bolsters inside the seats, it puts more space between those inside the car and whatever might be about to barrel into it. A GLC with the Driving Assistance Package Plus pack can also provide warnings of red lights, stop signs and pedestrian crossings and no entry restrictions. And will feature a traffic light view system for if you're parked under a traffic light and can't quite see it. Plus, there's an upgraded traffic sign assist system which can recognise signs and instructions on overhead gantries as well as conventionally posted speed limits. Active Lane Change Assist will see the car automatically change lanes with just a nudge of the indicator. The menu of features with the Driving Assistance Package Plus pack doesn't end there either. As mentioned earlier, this pack also includes limited autonomous driving capability to suit the mood of the moment. That comes courtesy of the pack's Active Distance Assist Distronic system, which is designed to operate on a dual carriageway and works with the Mercedes Active Steering Assist setup, which keeps you in the centre of your designated lane and will, if needed, apply subtle steering correction 
to ease you back to where you should be. The Distronic feature is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control that automatically regulates your distance to the car in front and can, if necessary, remotely slow the car with up to 50% of stopping power. It also works the active speed limit assist feature that automatically sets the cruise control to speed limit signs as you pass them. It's all very reassuring. The last time we tested a GLC, the updated version of the first generation model in 2019, this Mercedes was a little behind its BMW X3 arch rival when it came to matters of efficiency. That had to change, hence the decision that for this Mark II model, all the engines should be in some way electrified and none of them should be larger than four cylinders in size. The Mercedes AMG Formula One team got involved Heads were scratched in Stuttgart and the midnight oil was burnt in the engineering workshops. To achieve what? Class leadership, as it turns out. We'll quote WLTP figures for this conventional SUV body style here. Those of the slightly sleeker GLC Coupe body shape aren't much different. Thanks to the addition of the 48 volt mild hybrid system, the version of this car that most customers will choose, the GLC 220D diesel, delivers efficiency returns that are usefully ahead of the comparable BMW X3, the X3 xDrive 20D. The GLC 220D's 52.3 mpg combined cycle fuel figure may be around 8 miles per gallon off what you get from the comparable C220D estate model, but it looks good compared to the 47.9 mpg best managed by that competing BMW. The GLC 220D CO2 reading best of 141 grams per kilometer stacks up better too. The BMW is rated at a best of 154 grams per kilometer. As a result, the GLC 220D is benefit in kind rated at 33% as opposed to 35% for the BMW. These things matter which might make you want to look at the alternative 72 horsepower faster conventional GLC diesel variant, the GLC 300D, which still beats that feebler comparable X3, managing 51.4 mpg and 152 grams per kilometer. That BMW X3, by the way, is the best of the competing bunch. Opt for comparable base diesel versions of the Audi Q5, the Volvo XC60, or the Jaguar F-Pace, and you'll do worse. Even a petrol-powered Lexus NX 350h full hybrid can't match the GLC 220D model's fuel figure, though predictably its 129 gram per kilometer emissions figure does significantly better than this model's CO2 reading. On the subject of green pump models, we'll tell you that the efficiency readings for the GLC in conventional petrol form are impressive too, as evidenced by the fact that the figures achieved by the 254 horsepower GLC 300, 37.7 mpg and 171 grams per kilometre are virtually the same as those managed by a 190 horsepower BMW X3 xDrive 20i. So Mercedes has made a step forward here, if not quite as much of a step forward as the engineers might have hoped. The mild hybrid EQ boost system fitted to these engines works as mild hybrid setups usually do, using a belt-driven starter generator running off a 48 volt electrical system. The electrical element is certainly seamlessly integrated, cutting in and shutting down the engine completely at cruising speeds, which will often see you burning absolutely no fuel whatsoever. Plus, the EQ Boost technology allows for a greater level of kinetic energy regeneration, something you can monitor as you drive via an EQ Boost power and charge meter in the instrument cluster. As a result of all this, Driving range from the conventional model's 62-litre fuel tank has usefully risen. On the conventionally engined mild hybrid versions, there are various driving aids to help you maximise frugality. You'll obviously need to keep the car in its eco-dynamic select driving mode to get the best possible figures. And beyond that, the info part of the centre screen has a consumption section 
that graphically shows recent economy over the last seven and a half, 30 or 90 minutes. And a vehicle section that shows the percentage of accelerator or brake you're using at any given time. Additionally, there's an eco display graphic that can appear both in the middle of the instrument screen and on the head up display if fitted, which uses a red and green ball and a row of stars to show the frugality of your driving. Even if you enthusiastically use all of these efficiency orientated driving tools, though, they'll only take you so far towards ultimate frugality. When it comes down to it, as we continually remark in our tests these days, mild hybrid tech is a bit of a stopgap and nothing like as effective as the kind of full self charging hybrid system that Mercedes doesn't have. What it does have, though, is class leading plug in hybrid technology, which in this GLC 300E petrol test car sets fresh PHEV driving range standards thanks to the adoption of a much larger 31.2 kilowatt hour battery this time round. It was 13.5 kilowatt hours in size previously. Incidentally, that's also significantly larger than the 25.5 kilowatt hour battery a comparable C300e saloon or estate uses. As a result, the previous generation GLC 300e's model's best possible 27 mile EV range figure has been raised to a best of 80 miles. In our experience, you can take around 25% off that prediction in real world driving, but it's still pretty impressive. So a big step forward in PHEV tech has clearly been made and that's also reflected in the efficiency stats. The GLC 300E's combined cycle fuel figure has leapt to the heady heights of 565 mpg. Yes, you heard that right. Now, of course, that's not realistic. Yes, as usual with a PHEV, if you keep it plugged in, you can expect to match the returns of a frugally driven diesel model in conventional motoring. Exceptional frugality is certainly possible though. Expect up to 950 miles of driving range when the battery's charged and the tank's full. The GLC 300E's CO2 stat is impressive too, just 12 grams per kilometre, which of course is useful given the subsequent impact on a company car driver's benefiting kind taxation, here rated at 5%. Compare that to the 12% rating of a competing BMW X3 xDrive 30E. Also BIK rated at 5% is the alternative diesel GLC plug-in hybrid model, the GLC 300DE, and only black pump fueled PHEV in the class. This manages up to 706.3 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 10 grams per kilometer of CO2. With both these plug-in hybrid GLCs, you can maximize efficiency by making proactive use of the provided brake regeneration steering wheel paddles, or by activating the provided Eco Assist D Auto setting, which does it all for you. Mercedes has additionally added in a hybrid specific route planning function that uses the navigation, route topography, and traffic data to work out the most efficient route enabling, for instance, automatic prioritization of the electric motor in town driving. There's also a provided hybrid section of the centre screen, which gives graphic fuel consumption readouts and has energy flow and vehicle real-time monitors, so you can oversee the drivetrain throughout your journey. As you'd expect, that hybrid section of the centre screen allows you to set charging times. And on that subject, we ought to mention that, as with the current competition, neither of these plug-in hybrid GLC variants can use the very fastest ultra-rapid chargers. Other markets correct that with a 55 kilowatt ultra-rapid charging option, which allows for a 10 to 80% battery top-up in around half an hour. For the time being in the UK, though, PHEV GLCs have only a more conventional Type 2 format that replenishes the battery at 11 kilowatts AC and needs two and a half hours for a 10 to 100% charge. Many homes will have a 7.4 kilowatt wall box, which will take about four hours for a full charge. We haven't quite finished with PHEV powered GLC models though, because you can also plug in the very fastest version, the Mercedes AMG GLC 63S Formatic Plus. 
This top variant is engineered for performance rather than efficiency, which is why it can't even manage 10 miles of EV range. Mercedes says that it's not even essential that GLC 63 owners plug their cars in. The idea behind the use of an electric drivetrain for that faster 63 derivative is based instead around providing the instant power that the petrol engine can't and generating efficiency as you drive so even if the 6.1 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery doesn't have a lot of charge you'll still be getting a benefit. The GLC 63's hybrid system can regenerate over 100 kilowatts of electric power under braking to feed back to the battery and Mercedes claims that in 30 minutes of driving you'll be able to completely discharge the battery and recharge it twice. If you don't need all that PHEV complexity in your performance orientated Mercedes AMG GLC, then the brand will point you towards the lesser Mercedes AMG GLC 43 Formatic Plus model. This uses an uprated version of the conventional 48 volt mild hybrid 2 litre petrol engine used in the GLC 300 model we were talking about earlier. But without the benefit of a PHEV battery, there's the rather curious result that a 402 horsepower GLC 43 will cost you quite a lot more to run than a 680 horsepower GLC 63. Think around 35 mpg on the combined cycle and 165 grams per kilometre of CO2 for the 63 version and you won't be too far out. For the GLC 43 variant it'd be more like 28 mpg and 210 grams per kilometre though we've had to estimate these figures because at the time of filming neither of these two Mercedes AMG GLC models were yet on sale. Depreciation wise things look pretty good for this GLC. The previous generation model managed a 45% retained value in this SUV form after the standard 3 years and 36,000 mile ownership period. Though if you opt for the alternative GLC coupe body shape you'll get closer to the 50% figure boasted by an alternative Mercedes C-Class. What else might you need to know? Well, every Mercedes-Benz comes with a three-year unlimited mileage warranty against manufacturing or material defects and up to 30 years warranty against perforation due to corrosion. The brand also offers pan-European Mercedes-Benz roadside assistance, which is free for the first three years and thereafter automatically renewed for 12 months every time the car undergoes a full Mercedes recommended service until the car is 30 years old. Service intervals for the GLC will depend on how far you drive and under what conditions, but Mercedes does offer service care which allows you to spread your bills into manageable payments, guarantees the price of parts and labour for up to four services and covers the cost of recommended service items such as brake fluid, spark plugs, air filters, fuel filters and screen wash. You can set the centre screen in a service layout that shows oil level, coolant temperature and an assist plus readout showing the number of days until your next scheduled maintenance visit. In terms of insurance, the GLC is on the pricier side. The GLC 220D is rated at between 40E to 41E. For the GLC 300D, it's 44E. For the GLC 300 petrol, it's 42E to 43E. And for the GLC 300DE diesel PHEV, it's 49E to 50E. Given how advanced this second generation GLC is, it seems strange to think that in a decade or so's time, we'll be looking back at it as the kind of upper mid-sized SUV the industry used to make. Even at the time of this test, Mercedes models like the EQB and the EQE SUV seem at first glance to better represent the prevailing zeitgeist in this class. But right here, right now, this more conventional GLC model line outsells these EV models massively and will continue to do so well into its life cycle. This is the kind of Mercedes most people still want and sales figures suggest it's also the kind of premium brand upper mid-sized SUV most customers still want too. There's a combination here of technology, space and comfort that rivals still find it very hard to beat. And if you want it all with a slightly more dynamic spin, 
there's always the alternative GLC Coupe body style. We can't help wondering though whether Mercedes is putting continued success for this model line at risk by the sheer extent of the price increases made here. It's also disappointing that our market doesn't get the optional air suspension and four-wheel steering technology that would really give this car some unique selling points in its segment. But you can forgive it much because it feels so much like a proper Mercedes and a small but significant degree more desirable than most of its rivals. A continuing segment benchmark? You'd have to say so.